Hello there, this is Dr. Mintz. I'm going to show you two radiographs on the same patient manifesting congestive heart failure. Here's one, and then a later chest radiograph about 12 hours later. Okay, take a look. Here's the first, and the patient came in with shortness of breath. And you can see some findings here of interest. First of all, pleural fluid is present on both sides. You can say that these are areas of opacity uh, projecting in the lung base is bilaterally, more so on the right than the left. Also, the pulmonary vessels in the upper lobes are more prominent. They're hard to see here because of the other findings that are obscuring some of the findings in terms of the pulmonary vascularity in the upper lobes. But here you can see pretty well that these upper lobe vessels are a little prominent and if you look at normal chest radiographs and just take a moment when there's a perfectly normal chest x-ray, which there are plenty of usually, take note that usually you will see that the upper lobe vessels are less prominent than this. Now these are the pulmonary veins. These are the vessels that are draining the oxygenated blood from the lungs into the left atrium and then going out to the left ventricle and aorta, etc. Why do we get pleural fluid? Well, if you, you have an increase in back pressure because the heart is not able to keep up with the demands, so back pressure goes into the pulmonary veins and that's why they are distended. That back pressure in turn goes to the interstitial areas which are perfused with the pulmonary vessels, arterial and venous, and that results in some increased saturation of the interstitial tissues, and because the interstitial tissues are right next to the pleural surface, among other places, the fluid can accumulate in the pleural space. So you have heart failure producing back pressure so that the pulmonary veins cannot drain as well into the left side of the heart. The pulmonary veins therefore get more prominent and they leak fluid. They're not going to generally leak red blood cells or large macromolecules but they will leak fluid. So we get pleural fluid accumulating and usually some component of interstitial edema. You may get alveolar edema at a later, more severe phase. And that may be what's occurring here. It probably is to some extent. But if you look closely, you'll see that there's pleural fluid on both sides and that pleural fluid has increased considerably. And that accounts for most of the change that we're seeing here. Now it's not just the pleural fluid which contributes to the opacity that we're seeing predominantly in the lung bases here. Remember that when pleural fluid accumulates in the, in the chest, that fluid is around the lobes of the lung and they, the lobes are sorted and as a result, the lobes adjacent to the pleural fluid become compressed and you get atelectasis, in this case, compressive atelectasis. So here you see the right middle lobe. You know that this is right middle lobe here. You don't really see any right lower lobe, certainly not down inferiorly here. In the left, you see some retrocardiac opacity. I suspect that is purely atelectasis of the left lower lobe, compressive atelectasis related to the accumulation of pleural fluid. But this perihilar area of opacity to me looks more typical of the findings of congestive heart failure in the lungs themselves, and that would be interstitial edema and maybe developing some early uh, alveolar edema as well. So, basic point that Congestive heart failure is a reflection of 
inability of the heart to keep up with the demands for pumping of blood. This results in back pressure, among other places, into the pulmonary veins. Now, if the right heart fails, that's where the superior vena cava and inferior vena cava drain, and so they can get prominent in right heart failure. But in left heart failure, the back pressure expresses itself as dilatation prominence of the pulmonary veins, and that becomes most apparent in the upper lobes, as in this case. That increased pressure results in saturation of the interstitium, which is where the vessels run in the lungs, and that wetting, if you will, of the interstitial spaces can result in pleural fluid just by transudation or leaking of the, the fluid from the interstitial spaces into the pleural space. And eventually, you will get some component of alveolar edema as well. And this is the more severe phase, showing you that the pleural fluid has enlarged on both sides. The pulmonary vessels are probably more prominent, but they're really very hard to see in this case. And there's an area here which defines itself. Can you, you can probably see that this looks a little different than what we're seeing over here. There's something that's specifically perihilar, and it looks fairly homogeneous, so I suspect this is pulmonary edema. It's also possible it's lower lobe atelectasis that is just reaching up into the superior segment of the left lower lobe. In any event, this is typical for congestive heart failure. The heart doesn't look real big, but it doesn't have to be. It's not a matter of heart size that causes failure. It's the inability of the myocardium to adequately contract to allow the heart to keep up with the uh, demands. So, CHF, initially pulmonary vascular redistribution in the upper lobes, and then varying degrees of interstitial or alveolar pulmonary edema, as well as pleural effusions. The pleural effusions, when they're large enough, can produce compressive atelectasis, as in this case. So this is the early appearance, and this is the later appearance. Allow me also to point out that the pathophysiology text that we're using, or that you all are using, uh, I have the third edition of that. That's, I don't know if that's the latest one, but that has good discussions of both the normal physiology at the alveolar level, as well as the findings in pulmonary edema. So if, if this is the edition you have, third edition, the findings of pulmonary edema and the pathophysiology underlying it is on page 404, figure 1921 in chapter 19. And I think that's a good place to look. I, it's not that this is a pathophysiology course, but in order to understand the findings, in CHF, I think it's worth looking at and connecting what we're looking at here with what's happening on this microscopic level.